Episode 1, Korean Prehistory. So before we get into the history, let's just quickly catch up on what and where Korea is today. Presently, there are two Koreas. The Democratic People's Republic of Korea, or North Korea, and the Republic of Korea, or South Korea. Looking at a map, you can find the Korean Peninsula between China and Japan, surrounded by the Yellow Sea, the East China Sea, the Korean Strait, and the Sea of Japan, also called the East Sea. The first major land border of the peninsula separates North and South Korea. Starting at the Han River estuary, the border heads east for 160 miles or 250 kilometers to the east coast near Kosong. Until 1953, the border was defined at exactly 38 degrees north after the Japanese surrendered to the U.S. and the Soviet Union in 1945. By 1949, repeated hostile actions between the two Koreas led to war on June 25, 1950. The Korean War ended in 1953 with a ceasefire, not a peace treaty, the result of which is an ongoing Cold War over 65 years old. At two and a half miles or four kilometers wide along the entire border is a strip of land called the DMZ, or Demilitarized Zone, a neutral buffer zone between the two countries and is one of the most dangerous places on Earth. The second major land border separates North Korea from China and Russia. Separating China, starting at its mouth in the Yellow Sea, is the Amnok River, aka the Yalu. Next, tracing the river's path northeast will cross into the mountainous Pektu Range. The Pektu Range, often referred to as the Spine of Korea, runs almost completely down the peninsula from its peak at Mount Pektu, bordering China, to Mount Chidi, on South Korea's southern coast. The east chain of mountains also incorporate two other significant mountain ranges, the Tebek, which runs from North to South Korea along the East Coast, and the Sobek Range, which splits off the Tebek and joins with the Pektu Range on the Southern Coast, making it also a part of the Spine of Korea. Continuing Northeast from Mount Pektu, the rest of the border traces its path along the Tumen, or Puman River, bordering China until finally reaching the Sea of Japan, at the river's mouth where North Korea and the Russian Far East share their borders. Back to Mount Pektu, also called Pektu-san, is an active stratovolcano that officially stands at 9,003 feet or 2,744 meters. Just over a thousand years ago, around the year 946, a massive eruption occurred known as the Millennium Eruption or the Tianqi Eruption. It is considered to be one of the most violent eruptions in human history. Following the eruption of Mount Pektu, a lake formed at the caldera called Heaven Lake or Chunji in Korean, Tianqi in Chinese. The lake as well as the mountain are considered important to the cultures in that area, going back to prehistoric times. Prehistoric Korea, like discussing any country's prehistory, relies on what little we can discern based on carbon dating, excavations of artifacts, geological strata, and so on, and any ancient oral traditions that were passed down before being officially recorded and canonized would have been totally corrupted. At one of these archaeological sites, researchers uncovered evidence of human activity from two different chronological layers. Evidence from chopping tools, fossilized mammal bones, and habitation sites confirmed human presence in Korea as far back as the late Paleolithic, around 20 to 50,000 years ago. But at some of these sites, excavations have uncovered cultural layers that go back as far as the early Paleolithic period hundreds of thousands of years prior. It's important to note that these archaic humans were not ancestors to modern Koreans. Around 8000 to 1500 BCE is the generally accepted span of the Neolithic Age in Korea, or what scholars call the Chulmun Pottery Period. Divided into three parts, the early Neolithic would end around 4000 BCE, the Middle Neolithic around 2000 BCE, and the Late Neolithic around 1500 BCE. Each era would be marked by, dip, by the prevalence of a pottery style discovered throughout the region. Quoting Carter J. Eckert's Korea Old and New, a history, he writes, quote, 
The early Neolithic is marked by the making of, of simple, undecorated small vessels and of a pottery decorated haphazardly by adding short strips of clay to the body of the bowl or pot. Pieces of these types have been found at both northern and southern extremes of Korea's eastern littoral, in mid-peninsular regions as well, and also in Manchuria and Tsushima Island. The dates of these remains are variously put between 5000 and 6000 BC, but may be older. Around the 4th millennium BCE, the middle, the middle Neolithic period would be characterized by a pottery style called comb pattern pottery. This pottery was adorned with circular strips of, of clay stacked atop each other, or a more advanced technique of wrapping a singular strip of clay around the length of the base, and also decorating it with simple comb pattern markings along the exterior. Comb pattern pottery has been discovered throughout the peninsula along the coasts and as far as in Baiyue in southern China, the Jomon culture in Japan, the Xinglangwa cultures of Inner Mongolia, and even as far west as Finland. Finally, around 2000 BCE and the late Neolithic period, the prevalent comb pattern pottery will start using different shapes, sizes, and even include painted images like thunderbolts. While it's likely that each major period of the Julmun represents different migrations of human cultures throughout the peninsula, unlike the Paleolithic Koreans thousands of years before, the Neolithic Koreans are considered to be ancestors of modern Koreans. Neolithic Koreans, broadly speaking, enjoyed a daily life which consisted of hunting, fishing, foraging, and some low-level cultivation of wild plants. Upon entering the Middle Neolithic, the Koreans still subsisted off of hunting and fishing, but some ancient sites have uncovered evidence of domesticated grains, like millet. By the end of the Jilmun pottery period, archaeological remains show us that Neolithic Koreans have started to form small communities, as evidenced by clusters of dwellings at various sites. The Jilmun pottery period ends around 1500 BCE and leads into what is called the Mumun pottery period, or Korea's Bronze Age. This period spans over a thousand years from 1500 BCE to roughly the 3rd and 4th century BCE, but actual widespread bronze and metalworking isn't really seen until around the 9th century BCE. Bronze Age Koreans were a megalithic culture. This is due to the amount of massive stone dolmens found throughout the region. They're usually built in groups of three or four, but in rare cases, groups of over a hundred have been found. The dolmens are large, solid stone structures made up of narrower, long stones with a large stone laying across the top, resembling a table and used as a primitive tomb. The amount of social organizing effort to move and stack large stones weighing up to 70 tons and sustain them in the larger dolmen sites demonstrates that the person buried in one had to have been someone important. It is believed that there may have been up to 80,000 dolmens in Korea, although following the Korean War, only about 30,000 dolmens remain. That being said, there are more dolmens in Korea than anywhere else in the world. Bronze Age Koreans tended to live on slopes and hills, overlooking the flatlands and river waterways, which was ideal for the agricultural practices of the time. Around this time, we find crescent-shaped stone knives and grooved stones for hoeing, commonly associated with rice cultivation, which is believed to have been transmitted from China. Bronze Age Korean dwellings had been refined into rectangular shallow pits of varying sizes. Unearthed dwellings have shown fire damage, which indicates heightened usage, as well as the possible destruction as a consequence of warfare. Recovery of Bronze Age weapons like spear and arrow points also suggests the combat superiority of the Bronze Age Korean over his Neolithic ancestors. Around 1000 BC, evidence of a unique iron and bronze working technology is recovered from the, that area in the Chinese Liaoning region, just beyond the Yalu River. What's called the Liaoning Bronze Dagger Culture is characterized by the discovery of long, mandolin-shaped iron and bronze daggers in northeast China, Manchuria, and Korea. Later, a straighter and more slender style of dagger emerges on the peninsula in what scholars and researchers call the Korean Bronze Dagger Culture. Despite the archaeological discoveries, Bronze Age Korean cultures are still generally a mystery. Based on the dolmen burial sites, it's clear that societies were forming and recognizing chieftains 
who held considerable power, wealth, and status. Eckhart writes, quote, The individuals buried in Dolmen tombs were not simply leading members of a communal social structure, but rather were those who wielded authority in a stratified society, who then owned the bronze symbols of authority and enjoyed, it, enjoyed enough power to be buried in Dolmen tombs. Most likely they were the successors of the tribal chieftains of the Neolithic period, he continues. The territories ruled by Bronze Age chieftains were not very extensive. They controlled a modest agricultural population that farmed the narrow plains between the earthen fortifications they built on hillside plateaus. Although these small walled town states, sometimes called tribal states, retained a tribal character, their political structure was built around a territorial unit that subsumed populations other than the tribe alone. These walled town states were the earliest form of state structure to exist in Korea, and thus they represent the origins of Korean political culture. Korea's Bronze Age, the Mumun Pottery Period, ends around the 3rd and 4th century BC. As we mentioned earlier, Chinese influence in Korea during the Bronze Age was evident by the rice cultivation, agricultural technologies, and metal weapons technologies. Further, the discovery of Korean bronze daggers in China indicates that some transfer of information and technology was in place. One technology that would have been great if it could have been shared earlier is the written language. Chinese characters were adopted and used by the early Koreans at least around the 4th century BCE, but as evidence shows, the Chinese had started to develop writing almost a thousand years prior. The earliest concrete evidence of Chinese writing dates back to possibly the 12th century BCE with the discovery of the Shang Dynasty oracle bones. Inscriptions were scraped into the broad, flat shoulder blades of oxen and turtle shells and then put into a fire where the resulting cracks due to the heat expansion are then interpreted. I should also add that historically the Shang were also called the Yin in ancient times. Oracle bone writing is the earliest writing system from China and was likely to have started development centuries, even millennia earlier. How much contact was made between the early Chinese states and the tribes on the Korean Peninsula during the Neolithic and Iron Ages? We can't say for sure, but on the oracle bones, going back over 3,000 years ago, the Shang Dynasty put inscriptions on the bones talking about outsiders and foreigners called the Yi. Eventually, there will be Yi for each of the cardinal points, and by 700 BC, the Chinese will categorize, categorize Korea as part of the Eastern Yi. By this point, though, Yi has taken on another meaning, barbarian. In the next episode, we're going to start diving into some of the tribes and people living in Korea during this time, and get an overview of late Iron Age Korea and China. Thank you for your support. Thank you.